Today on Uncommon Knowledge, is it time to throw the switch on the death penalty? Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, the death penalty. Is it time to bury the death penalty or bring it back to life? It's been more than a quarter of a century now since the Supreme Court reinstated capital punishment in 1976. For most of that quarter of a century, the number of executions carried out in this country each year rose steadily. But in recent years, the momentum may have shifted. Two states, Illinois and Maryland, have declared moratoria on the death penalty. In 2002, two federal judges declared the federal death penalty unconstitutional, and the number of executions carried out has fallen from a high of 98 in 1998 to 66 in 2001. Is the death penalty unconstitutional? Is it immoral? Are we executing too many people? Or perhaps too few? Joining us today, two guests. Judge Alex Kaczynski sits on the Ninth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals. Scott Turow is an attorney who was a member of the Illinois Commission on Capital Punishment. He's also a best-selling author whose latest novel is about the death penalty. Reversible Errors. Pope John Paul II, quote, there is a growing tendency in civil society to demand that capital punishment be applied in a very limited way or even that it be abolished altogether, close quote. It's been abolished in Canada. It's been abolished in the European Union. Wouldn't we be saving ourselves a lot of trouble if we simply abolished it here? Scott Turow? Yes. Judge Alex Kaczynski? Yes, but life is trouble. Life is trouble, all right. I want to leave plenty of time for discussing ways of reforming right. the death penalty, but it's impossible to raise the issue without raising basic moral questions. Uh, so we have traditionally a couple of justifications for the death penalty. One is the notion of deterrence. We'll get to that. Uh, but the other is even more fundamental. It's that certain crimes are so heinous that putting to death those who commit them is the only way to satisfy the demands of justice. The death penalty is an end in itself. Does that argument have weight? Considerable weight. Uh, Immanuel Kant said it best. Uh, he said a society that is not willing to demand a life of somebody who's taking somebody else's life is simply immoral. Scott? I, I don't have any problem with the concept of what I refer to as moral proportion. Uh, the problem, however, is if you apply this notion of uh, ultimate justice and ultimate punishment for ultimate evil, it places an enormous burden of precision on the justice system. It must be able to identify what ultimate evil is, and it must be able to identify who committed it. And it must be able to do that virtually unfailingly. Otherwise, you begin to undermine the morality that you think you're protecting. OK, so uh, let me give you one example. We have the Washington sniper. I can't talk about the sniper you because can't. it's a case that might be pending in the right. courts. But All let's right. talk about the dead case, McVeigh. All right, McVeigh. McVeigh. Lots of dead bodies after. He has a trial. He has 17 lawyers appointed. Not, not a figure I'm making up. It costs $5 million to pray for his defense team. When all is said and done, a jury comes back with a guilty verdict. Death penalty is imposed. And right before he takes the lethal injection, what does he do? He says, yeah, I did it. And I'm glad. No remorse. There was no uh, racial bias. The jury looked just like McVeigh. This guy was not retarded. He was articulate. He was smart. There was not somebody who did it because of mental illness or anything of that sort. This was embodiment of evil. So the question really, and I'm not sure that Scott disagrees with me on this, mm -hmm. when the system works and when you manage to identify somebody who has done such heinous evil, do we as a society have a right to take his life? I think the answer is plainly yes. 
And I would go with Kant, and I would say it is immoral for us not to. So, so would you grant, then, that a starting point in talking about ways of reforming the death penalty is as follows. We must reserve a death penalty because there are certain cases on which everyone would agree that it's simply demanded. No. That you won't buy that formulation. No. The mistake we make, and the mistake I made, frankly, in a long time in my own sort of confused thinking about capital punishment, is that we allow these particular cases, like McVeigh, a terrible crime, uh, to be our way of addressing and thinking about and resolving the issue of capital punishment, instead of sitting back and saying, OK, there are these horrible cases. There's a, an argument that many of our citizens recognize as compelling. And surely what the judge has just postulated is a point of view that's broadly shared. But without asking, can we really construct a system that will reach those cases? There is, of course, no death penalty statute in the country that limits executions to the killers of 168 people. Uh, that's not how these statutes work. And the problem is not in the impulse, although there are people who have deep moral reservations mm -hmm. about the impulse, mm -hmm. but rather in what kind of system you construct. And we have failed time and time again. Let me move on to the, on to the second major justification for the death penalty, deterrence. 2001, three economists at Emory University published a study. Mm -hmm. Careful statistical analysis, they conclude that the death penalty does indeed have a deterrent effect. Statistician Ian Murray summarizes the findings, quote, each execution deters other murders to the extent of saving between eight and 28 innocent lives with a best estimate average of 18 lives saved per execution, close quote. Now, does that finding feel reasonable to you based on your experience and what you know about the death I, penalty? I am familiar with the study. I am familiar with the studies that preceded it. I am familiar with the stinging criticisms of them that have been uh, engaged in, including by a panel appointed by the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I, I do not accept personally the econometric bases uh, okay. of these studies, uh, but right. um, even if they were correct, they are so specialized that I would say to you that an argument that depends on a bunch of experts saying, trust me, in an issue that is as fundamental to the nature of a democracy simply can't be resolved that way. You know, because when you start quarreling with these people, what they say is, well, you don't have a PhD in economics. You can't understand what well, I'm you saying. You don't need a PhD in economics. Uh, what do you do about Christopher Scarver? What do you do about Ambrose Harris? You remember Christopher Scarver? He's the guy who, in the state of Wisconsin, that has no death penalty, took an iron bar and beat to death Jeffrey Dahmer and Jesse Anderson. Mm -hmm. Are we assuming that he committed murders before? Yes, he did. He was on with a life sentence already, the most serious punishment that Wisconsin can impose. So there was nothing else they could do to him. So he took an iron bar and he killed Jeffrey Dahmer. We know for a fact, statistically, uh, not, not statistically, experientially, that people who commit crimes, who commit murders, and are let out, go out and do it again. If you don't let them out, they escape. In escaping, they kill people. In escaping, they kill guards. If they don't escape, they kill others I think in, in prison. Uh, let me the example right. after example. Let me, let me note a few things. One, we, right. we've already tabled the issue of deterrence. So we'll assume that the arguments on that one are not compelling. Are you going to grant that? I don't need to grant it. I am willing to accept the study. I'm willing to accept that it is debatable. I'm willing to, uh, and I think it is a fact, a point, uh, a data point that we can consider, but we don't need it. So then we come to the issue of recidivism among murderers. Right. The, the argument uh, about capital punishment is not an argument for early release programs. Uh, it is an argument, for example, the commission I sat on in Illinois said that in any case where there is a death eligibility, uh, that case if the death sentence, is not, death sentence is not imposed, it ought to be resolved with life in prison without parole. I don't think escape uh, is a major problem. The it's a major problem for the people who get killed by the people who do escape. The judge is certainly right that there are people who are uh, killing machines, who will kill when given the opportunity. 
What do we do with those people? Uh, I made it a point to go visit the Supermax facility in Illinois, the TAMS uh, prison. It took a lot of begging and pleading for me to get down there while I was on the commission because they don't like uh, to allow outsiders to visit. But I wanted to see TAMS because I wanted to know for myself uh, whether it was possible uh, to design conditions of confinement that, um, that would address the issue the judge is raising. And I believe that supermax facilities can indeed do that. And I would also venture to say... Meaning eliminate the possibility of escape. They eliminate the... Po Let me just explain what a supermax yep. is for a yep. minute. Uh, in we have one in California. Right. It's called Pelican, Pelican Bay. Bay. Go ahead. Tell us the, what a Supermax is. Well, Supermax, uh, at least the way the TAMS facility is constructed, a prisoner is in an 8 by 10 uh, preformed concrete block. He has no flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact with any other human being The food gets ever. slipped in through a slot. As that's Sally Port, that's right. right. Once a day for one hour, the door is opened by remote control. Prisoner is allowed to go down a corridor uh, and... Uh, take fresh air for an hour, and there's also 15 minutes to shower. There is basically constant surveillance of those prisoners. It's very tough confinement. We have a facility like that in California, and we put people in there, and we put them just above the level of an animal. What they have there is no longer a life as a human being knows it. We essentially, it's closer to being dead than it is to being alive. We turn them into animals, we dehumanize them. And we may solve our conscience and saying, well, we didn't execute anybody while keeping them alive, but what we're doing to them is every bit as dehumanizing as executing them. Maybe more. Next topic. To what extent have the problems with administering the death penalty been created by the courts themselves? I sense a political trajectory that can be described over the last quarter century or so. And I may be wrong about this, so I want to put it on the table briefly and have you both bat it down or say, no, there's something to it. It runs as follows. Opponents of the death penalty have always been a minority in this country. No. No? No. There was a point in about 1965 where opponents... There was a majority? Of, it was a majority. All right. So since 1966, opponents have been in a minority in this okay. country. Fair. They haven't been able to persuade the American people for the last 30 years anyway. So they used the courts to work their will, placing restrictions on the death penalty of every kind imaginable, and now, having made c capital punishment costly and cumbersome, they complain that capital punishment is costly and cumbersome. That is to say, this unworkable machine has been constructed by the Supreme Court and uh, opponents of the death penalty operating through the court, and the fundamental problem is not that somehow the death penalty is costly and cumbersome and unworkable in and of itself, but that the popular will of the American people has been thwarted again and again and again for 30 years. No. <laughs> okay. This is, I mean, first of all, the, the cumbersome, uh, unworkable machinery has been created uh, by a court uh, that is disposed to, that has declared uh, capital punishment to be within constitutional bounds. What the court has said is that death is different. And indeed, it is different. It is for a democracy to take upon itself the killing of another citizen, recognizing that the citizens are the supreme authority, uh, is a very large step and one that has to be exercised with utmost care. Because one of the reasons that our friends in Western Europe cannot envision capital punishment is because they have been through the experience of seeing their democracies fall and other governments take their place and they say many of them I never want the state to be able to kill again so that it is clear it is clear when the state kills that it is the it is an act of a despot and not a democracy you'll go for that not at all I think the Europeans have a lot of gall teaching us about morality I mean, uh, they've had two world wars and the Holocaust on their territory. I don't think that they can teach us anything about morality. We've had a consistent death penalty in this country going back to the early days of the common law. Uh, we have never executed people in mass. We've always done it according to due process of law. Even in the West, when they, when they had Wild West law, there was a concept of due process. Not maybe due process as Carl and I would think is appropriate, but uh, there was always a concept that people get 
executed by the state only if proven guilty and proven guilty by, by a whole lot of evidence. What has On to reforming the death penalty. Let's begin with Scott Turow's recommendations. Scott has sat on a commission of 14 people appointed by the governor of Illinois. Right. And you recommended 85 reforms. Right. Let me name three. Alas, it's television. We have to engage in tremendous okay. compression. Okay. All right? Videotaping the interrogation of suspects in death penalty cases. Why is that important? It's important because the problem of false confessions, as for example, the Jogger case in New York has recently illustrated, or many of the cases in Illinois, is a pronounced one. Uh, and if you begin videotaping an interrogation from the time that Miranda warnings are appropriate, you're going to have a much more complete picture of how it is the defendant confessed. Most of the time, by the way, this will be of enormous assistance to law enforcement because it will do away with a lot of claims of coerced confessions. Videotape interrogations. You, you know, for that? I, I am not all that familiar with, with law enforcement okay. techniques, so I am willing to be educated on this point. It strikes me as faddish and likely to cause more harm than good. I'm willing to be persuaded on that. But, but so, all right, another one of you. Going but, 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 but you but resist. This is really a good technique. We, yeah. Why limit it to death cases? I agree. I mean, we throw people into prison for 40 years. 40 years. Imagine having 40 years cut out of your life. That is practically death. Well, if it's, so if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's really such a great idea for the death penalty, why not do it for all investigations? We'll start with death cases, and we'll see how it works. Okay. If you're Tarot concerned. is now advising the Illinois legislature. We in California will watch them. Prohibit death sentences when a defendant is convicted on the testimony of a single witness, mm -hmm. a jailhouse informant, or an accomplice. Mm -hmm. Scott? Uh, you know, speaks for itself. Speaks for itself. It may fit within our classic fact-finding standards, uh, but we can all recognize what the hazards are in single witness cases. I, I have a hard time generalizing. There, there may be lots of cases where there are more than one witness that are very weak, and there may be cases where a witness and corroborating testimony... Now, uncorroborated is what the recommendation was. You know, whether something is corroborated or not is a, is a bit it's of a... It's a legal question. It's a bit of a judgment call. From, again, from my training in the common law, we used to have... For example, you can't be convicted of treason under the Constitution unless you have two witnesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is sort of the concept of formal proof. It's a very continental concept. And, uh, and therefore to be viewed with suspicion. Absolutely. Anything <laughs> coming out of Europe, with the exception of England, of course, is, is to be viewed with suspicion. Ba banning the execution of the mentally retarded. Yes. Speaks for itself. It's not only did it speak for itself, it's now the law of that's, the land. That's over. That's over. The Supreme Court is... Does that one... Until the Supreme Court changes course, I think it is the law of the land. He just will not accept. Well, I, you know, I think though that the, the judge is actually making a point that um, you know, no no jurisprudence is more dynamic than death penalty jurisprudence. And if you think you're offering comfort to victims by telling them this person is going to be executed sometime in the offing, I differ with that for just that reason. There are. I don't know what the percentages are, but there are many, many families across the United States who were told that this person who is mentally retarded is going to be executed. Now they're going to go through it all again. Right. Uh, now, now let's turn to Judge Kaczynski's reforms. Again, I quote him to himself. Only two solutions suggest themselves, one judicial and the other political. The judicial solution is, quote, unlikely to happen. Now, the judicial solution is what, and why is it unlikely to happen? Declare the death penalty unconstitutional as violating the Eighth Amendment. Uh, it's unlikely to happen because the Supreme Court, I think, has pretty much committed itself to the, to the view, I think correctly so, that the death penalty is, in fact, constitutional. So the Supreme I, Court... I think it's very hard to come to that The court conclusion. will neither rule it unconstitutional nor make it easy. They're no, going to torture us all. None of the current justices... Take, uh, take, uh, uh, Justice Brennan, Justice Marshall, uh, who were on the court until uh, about eight years ago, uh, were of the view that all the death penalty is never constitutional. There's no justice that holds that view now. And Justice Blackman, in his very last right. term, I will not tinker further uh, with the machinery uh, of death. death. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, none of the current justices okay. take that view. So I can see no possibility that the majority of the court uh, will take that view within our lifetimes. We Scott, not you. I, within our lifetime, I wouldn't venture to say that. I really? certainly would venture to say that in the near term, uh, certainly not in the next decade. All right. We now turn to Judge Kaczynski's political solutions. Quote, 
state legislatures should draft narrow statutes that reserve the death penalty for only the most heinous criminals, mass murderers, hired killers, airplane bombers, for example. Now that dovetails exactly with one of your recommendations, it does. doesn't it? It does, and let me tell you why. Why is this important? I want to hear this point on which you both agree. Both of you tell me why that's important. Well, it's important because right now, uh, when you look over death penalty jurisprudence, you find two groups of people there. One, people who I'll refer to for shorthand as monsters who have committed horrific crimes. The McVeighs. The Mc McVeighs, Gacy, you don't have to Vaughan go that far. There, there, are, there are cases less horrible than that that are still unbelievably horrible. You also find a lot of people where you say, how in the world did this case get here? How, is this a, how did this person earn the same punishment as John Wayne Gacy? Um, and we have too many trap doors through which defendants can fall. Um, and you end up with an absolute moral hodgepodge in terms of who is on death row. So the theory is limit the circumstances. Be far more careful about who you are going to put there. But there is a big problem in doing this, as we have discovered in Illinois. The chairman of the Illinois Senate Judiciary Committee, a man named Kirk Dillard, who is a very good, decent guy, commented offhand to a reporter when this proposal uh, was leaked the day before the report came out. He said, well, that's headed straight for the trash bin. Why is it headed straight for the trash bin? Because American legislators will not be soft on crime, will not be confronted with the prospect of having to campaign in the future with somebody saying, he reduced the death penalty. They all want to be... Can I just ask you, so we have now... They just made the wrong argument, is the, is the, is the problem. You see, what happens now, we have 3,000 or 4,000 people on death row. We execute something like 50 or 60 a year. Right. We'll never get to them. So the good, the bad, the ugly, the heinous, and, you know... Uh, and you, of that they, 50 or 60 a, a year, that's, if one may use the term, garden variety murders, mi intermixed in exactly. a haphazard way with monsters. Exactly. But right. we're spending money... We're spending societal resources to put 3,000 people on death row at the rate of about 600 a year. We actually spend more than that because some people get tried for capital murder. We spend the resources, we give them the extra lawyers, we spend the, the, the extra investigators and so on, and they don't get the death penalty. So it's extremely expensive. Extreme. This is the word. This is the word. Finally, some last thoughts on reforming the death penalty. If I made then both of you, not author and attorney and not judge, but co-emperors for a day, is the outcome that you would this like... in Rome. <laughs> that's right. Uh, is the outcome that you would like to see that we continue to execute, say, 50, 60, 70 people a year, but that the number of people who go on death row is 50, 60, or 70. Once you're condemned to death, there's a very high, much higher likelihood that the execution will actually take place, and that all those 50 to 70 people are in the monster category. Is that roughly what you'd like? That's what I would like. It, and I, does that and suit I you? Think, I think it will never happen. And because we it's, have politically not, Scott, it's politically untenable. It's politically untenable. Scott, and, Scott, wait, 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 you didn't answer the question? We have not. No, he said he'd like it. We have not. Oh, did, did you? We yes. have not addressed the issue of innocence. We have not even begun. You know, he doesn't buy that. that. Yeah, I, I have a quotation in here somewhere. Judge Kaczynski, uh, innocent, uh, what was, innocent defendants are very rare, and innocent convictions in capital cases are even rarer, or words to that effect. And in innocent Judge, people who have been executed are non-existent. Well, that, that, as I've said before, is unprovable. That's, uh, We're coming to the end of our time, but can you briefly tell us what happened in Illinois? Well, in Illinois, in we had 13 people. We've executed 12 since death penalty was reestablished in 1977. We've exonerated 13. See, uh, the system works. The yep, system yep. works. These are not people who got executed, and then we found out that they were that they were uh, that they were innocent. In fact, the two times, once in Virginia and once in Texas, where the guy said, "Give me my DNA, give me my DNA," and they stopped the execution. Governor George W. Bush stopped the execution. Uh, in Virginia, they stopped the execution. They gave him the test, proved the guy did it. So why do prosecutors resist doing it? I don't know. I can't speak for prosecutors, but I, what I what I can tell you is that in a sane society. We can, in fact, 
uh, and a society that's willing to commit itself to it, we can in fact determine who is guilty and who is innocent. So how would you sell it, Judge? I would sell it on dollars and cents. I would sell it and say it's an expensive enterprise. We're putting a lot of people on death row. It's incredibly expensive to put them and keep them there. We execute very few. Much better to do what you said. I mean, what you represented was a result I, I would want. And that is to be very, very careful. You really only go after the really terrible, heinous guys. Monsters. In the way in which yeah, the yeah, Illinois committee, com Commission make really, really, really sure that they did it. Do it quickly. Let, let me Just tell you do, do exactly what they did with McVeigh. Let me tell you about Do it, it quickly. Do it publicly. Spend the money to do it right. And then execute it. Both of you advocate reducing the number of capital crimes five years from now. How many states will have done so in a way that impresses you? Zero. Zero? Two. <laughs> Which two? Illinois and California? Right. All right. Each year in the United States, we put 60, 70 people to death. Right. Five years from now, will that number be higher, lower, about the same? Scott? My bet from the seat of my pants is probably about the same. Judge? It's been niching up. It'll be higher. It'll be higher? It'll be higher. It'll be higher. Scott Tarot, Judge Alex Kaczynski, thank you very much. Thank you. Both. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. We are PBS.